In the previous video, we used a step-by-step -step approach to generate the ANOVA table for the Chemitech example. That obviously is a hard way. We will almost never conduct the ANOVA that way in practice, but hopefully it helps us understand how ANOVA works better. Here in this video, I'm going to introduce another two different ways for one-way ANOVA using the same example. First, I will use the stats models library in Python to generate the ANOVA table, and then I will demonstrate how to use the sample means and sample standard deviations to generate the information in the ANOVA table. Let's review our example quickly. Here, in this Chemitech example, we would like to study whether the choice of assembly methods makes a difference to the units of filtration systems assembled per week. According to our experiment, we have collected the following information. Five workers were randomly assigned to each of the three assembly methods A, B, or C. And the units assembled per week by each worker have been recorded in this table. We also have sample means and standard deviations here in this table for each assembly method or treatment. We are going to test whether the three population means corresponding to each of the three methods are indeed equal. Now, let's import the libraries, modules, and the functions we will need, including stats modules, in particular the OLS module, as well as pandas library and F distribution. Here, OLS stands for Ordinary Least Square. Pandas library is one of the most useful Python libraries particularly for data science and data analytics. Next, let's create the data set and label the data, and then we convert it into a data frame. Data frame is the most fundamental data structure in Pandas. It is essentially the same as a data table or a spreadsheet in Excel, like what you can see over here. Then, we fit the model using the OLS module. Effectively, one-way ANOVA is equivalent to a simple linear regression model. In this model, the dependent variable or the response variable is the units assembled. The independent variable is a categorical variable which takes on three possible values, method A through method C. Here, you can see the ANOVA table generated by the stats models. Many other types of software, including Excel, can probably do a better job and provide more information, but the stats models can get the basic job done. In this simple ANOVA table, we see method and residual in rows. Method is nothing but our treatment and Residual is nothing but the errors. So the value 520 under sum of squares is SSTR, sum of squared variations caused by method or treatment. Similarly, the value 340 is our SSE, sum of squared errors. In the next column, there are the degrees of freedom associated with treatment and residual. In this example, we have three methods. The resulting degree of freedom is 3 minus 1, which is equal to 2 for method. The degree of freedom of the residual is the sample size n, which is 15, minus the number of method, which is 3, 
That's where the value 12 comes from. If you recall, the F test statistic is equal to MSTR, mean squared variation due to treatment, divided by MSE, mean squared error. But MSTR is nothing but SSTR over its degree of freedom 2, and MSE is nothing but SSE divided by its degree of freedom 12. The resulting value of the test statistic, as you can see over here and here, is 9.1765. Based on the value of the test statistic, we can compute the corresponding p-value of our test by calling the F distribution. The p-value is roughly 0.4%, so we can reject the null hypothesis and conclude that not all three population means are equal. You may wonder what PYP equals 2 means. Here I will not go into the details. If you are interested, feel free to check out the meaning of type 1, 2, and 3 sum of squares for ANOVA. Okay, now let's try something different. Earlier, I showed you the sample means and sample standard deviations for each of the three methods. With PANDAS, it's very easy to get these descriptive statistic summaries. First, you can see the summary of the entire sample of 15 workers. The mean or the grand mean is 60 units per week. The sample standard deviation is 7.84. Similarly, we can generate the summaries for each of the three assembly methods. To make our life easier, I summarize the key information over here. X bar is our grand mean. S is the standard deviation of the entire sample. N is the total sample size, 15. X1 bar is the mean of method 1. S1 is the sample standard deviation of method A and so on and so forth. Now, we are ready to find SSE, SSTR, and all the values we just saw in the ANOVA table. First, let's recall that SST is equal to the sum of SSE and SSTR. The basic logic is that the total variation around the overall mean or the grand mean, which is characterized by SST, has two sources. One is the variation caused by using different assembly methods or treatment. This part of variation is described by SSTR, sum of squared variation due to treatment. The other source is the randomness, sometimes also called as white noise. This part of variation is characterized by SSE, sum of squared errors. Naturally, we have SST equals SSTR plus SSE. SSE is measured with the deviation of each data point from the mean of its group or method. Then, we square each of the deviations and add them up. It gives us SSE. But if you recall, that's exactly how we compute sample variance, except that we have to take the sample size into account. So, SSE here is equal to N1 minus 1 times S1 squared plus N2 minus 1 times S2 squared and N3 minus 1 times S3 squared. We started with 15 data points representing 15 workers. But in order for us to compute the SSE, we need X1 bar, X2 bar, and X3 bar. As a result, we lose 3 degrees of freedom. So 
the degree of freedom of SSE is 15 minus 3, which is 12. Another way to look at it is that since we must know x1 bar, x2 bar, and x3 bar, if you tell me the values or the units assembled of any 12 workers, I can tell you the values or the units assembled of the three remaining workers. In other words, you only have the freedom to choose 12 values. Thus, the degree of freedom of SSE is 12. SSTR is to measure the variation between method or treatment and the grand mean. So each data point is represented by its group mean or the mean of its treatment. For example, the first worker is assigned to method A who assembled 58 units per week. To compute the variation caused by treatment, we use its group mean or in this case x1 bar, which is 62 minus the grand mean 60, we then square the difference. Since we have five workers assigned to method A, we do it a total of five times. That's why you see m1 times x1 bar minus x bar squared over here. Then we do the same for methods B and C. Adding everything together gives us SSTR. The degree of freedom of SSTR is 3 minus 1, which is 2. We start with three sample means, x1 bar through x3 bar, but we need the grand mean for computing SSTR. So we lose one degree of freedom. In other words, since we have to know the grand mean, if you choose the values of two sample means, I can tell you the last sample mean. You only have the freedom to choose two out of three. Thus, the degree of freedom of SSTR is two. SST measures the deviation from the grand mean. Following the similar logic applied in computing SSE, we can compute SST by doing the following. SST equals m minus 1 times s squared. Hope you can figure out the degree of freedom of SST now. In the end, let's print out all the results and take a look. All the values indeed match what we saw earlier in the ANOVA table.